And I think the pandemic is, wow, that's a huge one. Like I'm still trying to wrap my head around when I look back and think like, what have these last few years been? Like, what will this mean in the long-term narrative of our family story? I think it's hard for me even to grasp how, what, how has this changed my individual family, let alone the world. Can you say, this is Dr. Amanda Zella Husky? Why do we have to? Just try it. Well, I can't. Deep breath. <laughs> okay. This is Dr. Amanda Zella Husky. Lindsay Malloy. Ah! Now, wait, say Dr. Lindsay Malloy. Dr. Lindsay Malloy. No, come back. <laughs> This is Dr. Lindsay Malloy. Welcome to the Potato and Potato and One more time. And then after that, can we have a candy No. <laughs> Please, Mommy. Okay, ready? Pandemic Parenting Podcast. Excellent. Please note that the information contained in this podcast and on the Pandemic Parenting website are intended for educational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this podcast or provided on the website are intended to be a substitute for professional psychological advice, diagnosis, or treatment. No doctor-patient relationship is formed between the hosts or guests of this podcast and listeners. If you need the qualified advice of a mental health or medical provider, we encourage you to seek one in your area. positive psychology. What is it? How can it help us? And more specifically, how can we hold both the negative and positive experiences of the pandemic together in the stories we tell ourselves? I'm so excited to have Dr. Lindsay Malloy back with me behind the mic to dive into these topics. We talk through some specific ways you and your kids can incorporate some positive psychology coping strategies in your everyday life. Welcome back. Dr. Lindsay Malloy. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Amanda Zella Husky. I still I know how to say your name. <laughs> <laughs> I miss you so much. Um, and Aww. yeah, I miss you so much. I'm so glad you're back. Like my favorite researcher ever in this season of focusing on a lot of the research related to the pandemic that we're going to get to talk about a topic today that I think we both find really important. So I'm so mm. glad it's you I get to talk to. Oh, thank you. It's good to be back. Is it though? Mostly. Is it mostly. Good to be back? <laughs> sort of uh, mixed feelings. Yes. So where have you been? Let's start there. So I was on research leave in England, just outside of London for the year. And I'm extremely grateful to Amanda and uh, the whole pandemic parenting team for holding the fort and doing an amazing season two of the podcast, really getting in there and looking at what did we learn? We, you know, meaning <laughs> the other re researchers out there, what yeah, did the field. we collectively, the field learn about the effects of COVID and, and the, the pandemic on, on kids and parents? Well, you're welcome. We we have had a blast diving into this research, um, but also, like I said, I'm really, just really glad you're back. And so, yeah. So when we started pandemic parenting way back when, which feels in some ways like a hundred years ago, and in some ways feels like a month ago, mm -hmm. part of the reason is because we were both doing research, you know, related to how the pandemic was impacting families. And obviously, the research has come so far since then. And one of the things I know you and I were both mindful of in our research and in a lot of, I guess, just, at, you know, types of research in our respective disciplines and in related disciplines is focused on, right, how this has been really hard for people in a lot of ways, for parents, for children, for mm -hmm. kids at di different developmental stages, for people in different life circumstances. So we, as you said, have really been diving into that research this whole season. But one of the things we haven't focused a lot on is how people have grown and evolved in some of the positive aspects of that. Yes. So I think we wanted to dive into some of that today. Positive psychology. Yep. My, uh, my strength has really always been my just overwhelming positivity. Uh, <laughs> people always say that about me. <laughs> my husband always says that about me, just how I can always look at a situation and just see the good, you know? Um, <laughs> I'm being very I, sarcastic right yeah, now. But... I am hearing that dripping with sarcasm. <laughs> and I think that is, but that makes sense. Like we mm. are immersed in studying and thinking a lot about, right, um, adverse experiences for kids. We work a lot of, have a lot of interface with the legal system. So mm -hmm. some of the most difficult times in people's lives. And so I think it is hard for us to remember to look at the positive sides of things because we spend so much time thinking about and studying people's crises. 
Right. But also like in our own lives, right? Mm-hmm. I, I'm not a natural optimist either <laughs> in my nature. So so I think that's why this this topic is so important. And we'll yeah. talk about why it's important. Yeah. And if we think back to especially those early days of the pandemic, just how much uncertainty and fear were just part of our daily existence. And I think as parents, even if you do have an optimistic outlook, it's very natural to worry about your kids. Um, and so there was a, you know, a lot of concerns. And I think when I talk to other parents about the pandemic, you know, a lot of them want to know, they don't necessarily ask like, how might this experience have helped my child grow over the last two years? No, mm-hmm. they want to know like, what kinds of effects could this have had on my child? And they're, they're asking about concerns or worries of negative effects. And so it's, I think it's very natural to, to want to understand those. And a lot of people have focused on understanding those, but then the flip side of that is, well, how can these experiences change us and help us grow in more beneficial ways? Because they are, they are out there, you know, you just have to look for them. That's right. Yeah. I think you're right. Those are a lot of the questions I get too, is are my kids going to be behind? How is this Mm going to impact our family in the long term? You know, what does the stress and adversity look like for us? But the reality is there has been a lot of growth. And that's, Mm -hmm. I think some of what we're going to dive into today too, because it is really important to remember that and actually to reflect on that because it helps you cope with the things that weren't so great or were harder. Definitely. So I don't know if people know that there is this whole field out there known as positive psychology. Um, Again, psychology tends to focus a lot on what's going wrong in people's lives or what's atypical, but there's this whole branch of the field called positive psychology, which is really focused on studying what is good about people, what's going right in life. How do those experiences then buffer experiences that are not so great? And so Mm -hmm. I think We wanted to talk a lot about this and some of the research related to it, both during the pandemic, but in other contexts too, because it matters a lot for long-term well-being. And that's some of what what the research shows, which we'll talk about. But I know that you and I have also always talked about being very mindful of not veering into what is also talked about as toxic positivity, Mm -hmm. right? So um, that's a term often used to kind of relate to this idea that, you know, no matter how difficult a situation is, people should always maintain this positive mindset. And we've talked about that in a number of our, you know, webinars and podcast episode that there are some very real challenges, stressors and traumas people have faced over the last few years. And so we want to kind of distinguish between the idea of toxic positivity of just, it's fine. Everything's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always a silver for a reason and you can always... Yeah, exactly. every experience happens for a reason and it's it's good. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, makes you stronger. and all those kinds of like cliches. cliches. Yeah, we definitely <laughs> want to stay away from those. But then there, like you said, there is a legitimate field that tries to think about and study and examine, you know, closely the the things, the protective buffers, the experiences, the the connections, the the people um, that actually sustain us and, and, uh, and, and keep us going in these difficult times. So we do have to look at that side of things too, especially if we're looking for solutions and mm-hmm. ways of, of helping people get through these inevitably difficult times that we'll all face in one form or another, hopefully yeah. not another pandemic anytime soon, but right. <laughs> I'm sure right. there will be other things where we can use some of these coping skills. Yeah. And that is how some of the research has looked at it is, you know, in previous natural disasters, crises, you know, broader collective traumas or those kinds of situations, you know, how have some of these positive experiences or or framing of things helped people to cope in those contexts? So I wanted to focus especially on a study that Leah Waters and her colleagues did at the Center for Positive Psychology at the University of Melbourne in Australia. We have actually talked about Dr. Waters' work in a previous episode as well, the one where we focused on teens in the pandemic and how they have coped. And so because they do so much great work focused on positive psychology, just wanted to sort of amplify some of the findings that they had in that study, because I think it relates to some of what what we can talk about, you know, is that we've been sort of watching and studying over the last few years too. And one of the things that um, Dr. Waters and her colleagues highlight is this concept of dialectical thinking, which is something I have focused on a lot in my work. It was actually the the crux of the TEDx talk I gave a number of year, years ago, how we can use dialectical thinking, which is sort of holding things that might 
feel like they're in opposition or mutually exclusive, actually the ability to sort of hold them together. So what Dr. Waters and her colleagues talk about is this idea that throughout the pandemic, to be able to equate these two things. So we can endure these really high levels of stress, they said, during the pandemic, and yet still experience aspects of positive mental health. So I want to dive into that a little bit. Like, what does that look like where we can accept and acknowledge, wow, this has been really awful and hard. And we've had these examples of growth in our families, in ourselves as parents, as individuals, as professionals, whatever the case might be. So, but it's challenging, right? Unless you have somebody sort of helping you see what often feel like opposites, right? Like I, right. this has been so awful and terrible, but is there a way to say, and these are the ways mm. my family has grown in this. So, and I, yeah. I think there is a way, but it does, and maybe this isn't the case for everyone, but it does take more effort. I think it takes usually someone else asking that question uh, and going, oh, Oh, okay. Well, I've been so focused on sort of triage mode and crisis management of like, what is the most important crisis in my house today or at my job today that I have to fix or deal with and not really taking the time to reflect and think about, well, oh, well, how, how has, you know, how have we grown as a family or as, as a person? It does kind of take someone else often asking that question and having to pause and give it some thought. And hopefully there's something that comes to mind when you do pause, but we just don't get the chance to do that very often. I find we don't. And I agree that it takes other people to help do that for us, ask us, or kind of make us accountable to reflect in those ways. But sometimes we don't always have that. Like I am thinking back to one of our earlier webinars, I think where you had talked about gratitude journaling. Mm. Um, so how, like, that's a great example to me of how do you sort of force yourself at the end of a day where it just feels like so much has gone wrong, you know, to, to just stop and reflect, like, can you talk a little bit about how you've done that? Yeah. I, um, I learned about that when, um, uh, Marty Seligman gave a talk at my old university and he's sort of often thought of as like the father of positive psychology. And so he talked about, and I think the thing that allowed me to do it was just how simple it was. So the idea of journaling makes me think of someone, sitting like in a window, you know, wistfully, like (laughs) writing page after page after page. And of course, like just hearing those, that term journaling, I'd be like, oh, I don't have time for that. Right. But when he described it as the three things, like the three good things, and just sort of sitting down at the end of the day before bed, and it doesn't have to be before bed. He just, you know, that's a good way to kind of help you maybe ease into sleep is to think about some of the, the good things, but it was three things that went well that day three good things. He called them the three good things. So three things that went well that day, they could be really big things. Like I had a a niece or nephew who was born, like that's a pretty big thing. Or it could be something like, you know, the recipe that I made for dinner went really well, or, you know, I said no to something. (laughs) Well, yeah, I don't even try anymore, but you know, or (laughs) I, you know, I, I really drank enough water today, like whatever it is, just can be something really simple, but you, you know, where the kids fought, minimally today. (laughs) Um, Again, don't get to write that one that often, but you know, but you know, just those things and just write them down and jot them down. Like what were they? And why do you think they went well that day, you know, or, you know, how do you think it like helped you? So we were talking about a few words or sentences and that feels doable. And that has been linked with, you know, various positive uh, effects and, you know, ways of kind of promoting people's mental health. So for me, it has to be something simple right now. Um, And that one was quite simple. And it was a way of thinking about the things that have gone well, instead of just dwelling often before bed too, we tend to do that, right? Like, oh, I didn't do this or this or this. And I, this went terribly. And I, you know, and you kind of beat yourself up, but this is a way to like shift that focus. Yeah. I I think it's such a great strategy. It's along the lines of what Dr. Waters and her colleagues talked about as coping. So in this study, They talked about how we think so much about coping related to negative situations, right? Like how do you cope with depressive feelings? How do you cope with feelings of anxiety? Mm. And so they really wanted to highlight, like, what does it look like when we use coping strategies to focus on increasing those positive feelings or effective states like gratitude? And so I think what you're talking about, you know, showing gratitude or, or being really intentional about what are three things that I felt went well today or I'm grateful for is a great way to really amplify some of those positive feelings Mm -hmm. and and states. So some of the others they suggest are, 
just trying, you know, to notice positive events, like you talked about, you know, something exciting happening in the family, big or small, you know, my kindergartner, or excuse me, oh my gosh, first grade, you'd kill me for saying that. <laughs> my first grader came home so excited yesterday to show me in his folder, you know, that he got on blue for their behavior chart in mm. his class. And it was just like a huge deal. And it's one of those small moments, but for him was, was huge. And so like, all of my, you know, other kids and my husband, we all just started like cheering. Like he had just won the Super Bowl, right? Because yeah. he was so excited to uh. tell us. And so that's a tiny moment, you know, amidst other days where we have not had that positive behavior <laughs> report that we're just, we're noticing it and, and celebrating it. Like it's a huge deal. Um, they talked about savoring, you know, so again, just being able to kind of along the lines of being mindful, like take in those moments that might feel really small, but actually mm -hmm. are quite big to, to sustain you. So I think about this a lot, like when you talked about kids fighting or there was minimal fighting, like amidst the fighting, sometimes I, again, I have three boys, they wrestle a lot. There is a lot of fighting mm -hmm. and physical activity, you know, that sometimes starts out really fun and then turns into fighting. But so those moments that I sort of just look up and I'm about to sort of holler at somebody to get off of somebody else. And they actually, they aren't fighting. They're, mm -hmm. they're laughing and, and rolling around in pure joy rather than what I sometimes assume might be a negative interaction. So just being mindful and like taking that in, like, that's awesome. You know, that they were laughing together like that. Acts of kindness. They talk about, you know, trying to notice those that's a way to really focus on positive coping. Um, and one of the ones I think you and I have emphasized in this work a ton is this idea of self-compassion or giving yourself mm -hmm. grace, mm -hmm. how important that is to really, in, you know, increase positive coping instead of always focusing on, you know, coping with the right. negative thing. And some so. of these things we can do with our kids too. I mean, I didn't do a great job of this with mine, um, admittedly, but I had bought them their little gratitude journals where they could think about something that had went well that day at the end of the day. We uh, we talked about in one of our episodes um, with Dr. Zoe Klemfus and Angela Evans, Dr. Angela Evans, we talked about the rose thorn bud technique, which I've brought out at various stages of the pandemic. But at the end of the day, you know, asking your kids, what was your rose for today? Like the thing that went best for you today, your favorite part of the day. And then your thorn is what, you know, what was the negative part of the day or, you know, the, the thing you liked least today, which can be a good way to get at some of those problems your ch child might be having, like coping with something at school maybe. And then the bud was, what are they most looking forward to? And even really little kids can do this. And it's a nice conversation starter. And sometimes they still say to me like, oh, even if we're not in the midst of doing it, they'll be like, what was your rose today? Or, you know, they don't ask me so much about my thorn, but <laughs> they probably already know what that is. Um, it's like when you needed to be told 72 times to get your shoes on. Um, but no, but it, you know, what was your rose? And, and so, yeah, a lot of the things that we're talking about, you can sort of do as a family, I think. Yeah. I love learning about that rose thorn and bud technique. And there's an infographic that we have up on our site that we'll also link to in the show notes. Um, Cause it is, it's such a great one. You know, that doesn't always feel, I think sometimes when we're trying to ask people like, what was your most favorite thing that happened today? Or the best thing, like that can feel like a lot of pressure for mm -hmm. kids and adults. Anytime you're asking them to identify like that one huge thing versus just, Hey, what was something in your day today that, you know, yeah, it was great. Yeah. So I, I like the way in positive psychology, we tend to emphasize this, you know, don't just focus on decreasing the negative things, but how do we really amplify and increase the positive things that help us generate more of, you know, that those positive feelings, but just also meaning like meaning is another big part of positive psychology. How do we make meaning of things that have happened and even negative things or crises? You know, how do we start to think about the significance or what does that narrative look like when we go back and reflect on, you know, what just happened and what that means in the broader context of our lives. And I think the pandemic is, wow, that's a huge one. Like I'm still trying to wrap my head around <laughs> when I look back and think like, what has this last few, what have these last few years been? Like, what will this mean in the long-term narrative of our family story? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a huge question that I'd love to keep investigating with our research. And, you know, there's a whole literature on, on meaning making and how people make meaning of traumatic or negative experiences. You know, I've looked at that literature. We're doing some work on how children make meaning of their immigration experiences, um, which is another big transition. But this pandemic is such a strange one because it has had so many different aspects because it's gone on for so long. It's not like an easily identifiable event per se. There's like a whole lot of events and it's 
you know, years in the making. So it's, yeah, it's a different thing to think about, but it is hard to kind of, I think it's hard for me even to grasp how, what, how has this changed my individual family, let alone the world. And I think as time gets away, right, we sort of move further and further away, even from some of those beginning feelings we might've had or circumstances. I think we start to think about it in these more vague what's the right word, like collective terms. And it can Mm -hmm. be helpful to actually start to get into the nuance. So instead of just looking back and thinking, wow, that, that period of time was just bad. (laughs) Like it was just (laughs) awful. It was rough starting to, to tease out and give yourself some nuance there. So when we think about all of the things, which we've talked a lot about in some of our previous episodes and conversations that we've lost, that we're grieving, right? Mm -hmm. What feels, yeah. What just feels bad about it teasing out like, okay, well, actually what aspects were we grieving, but maybe what aspects were we not? You know, there were ways that a lot of people have talked about reinventing themselves, the great reset for your mm-hmm, family, you know, mm-hmm. whether that just means how busy you were or reevaluating some of your values and priorities. So teasing out, you know, what aspects of this did feel really difficult? Are we sad to have lost, but what things were we able to do instead? teasing out the meaning of this beyond just it was good or it was bad, I think it's going to be important for all of us. Right. Helping people to learn exactly what they liked and disliked maybe about their jobs or about, you know, the way their family was functioning, like were they way overscheduled or maybe like with us, it was not enough. So now that we're, we've kind of come back, you know, I'm signing the kids up for everything because they, (laughs) they were just coming into this, having organized, organized activities when the pandemic hit. And so I don't know, maybe I'm trying to make up for lost time. I'll probably hate myself later when we're going to the (laughs) fifth activity of the week, but it just, that's, you know, my way of handling it. Someone else's way would be very different, but you know, there are people who, who realized that, you know, I miss working in an office so much. I miss the camaraderie of other people. I want to be around other people. And that's a, I mean, that's a valuable thing to learn. Like I can't handle this working from home thing. Whereas other people, it was, you know, maybe a very different experience. And so, I mean, hopefully businesses and organizations learned a lot from this as well. And, you know, we've talked a bit about some of those things in some of our previous podcast episodes. But yeah, it was, I guess, a time to reset, as you said, and and think about what works Mm -hmm. and what doesn't. Yeah. And that it just because this is the way we've always done it, we don't have to keep doing it that way. We've talked a lot about decision making and, you know, how you can make decisions in incremental ways rather than feeling like they're so permanent or, or global. But yeah. And, and for our kids to evaluate some of those things, I loved some of those conversations as we were able to start thinking about getting into various activities. Like, do you even want to do this anymore? <laughs> like, just because you've done it before, you don't have to keep doing it. And, you know, same for us. Like I have noticed as somebody who's typically pretty extroverted and social, I don't really want to go to as many social things as I Mm -hmm. did in the past, or I, or maybe even better. I don't feel pressure to like, it's fine Mm -hmm. for us to say, you know what, we're just not doing that this weekend. And that's okay Um, to be able to sort of be more intentional about your schedule and and what you do has been a, a really good lesson and important lesson for all of us, at least in my house. How have you coped with or what sort of research have you maybe seen that's related to the never endingness of this and coping with feelings like this is never going to end and some of the hopelessness that might come along with that? Yeah, I think a lot of that is it's in some ways goes back to those big black and white statements, right? Like this is so bad, or this is never going to end, like you said, or, you know, we're never going to recover from this. And I find for myself, but also I think we see this a lot in in the research and some of the clinical intervention strategies, it's these importance of of separating feelings from facts, which can also kind of go back to the, the dialectical way of thinking we were talking about before, but just, okay, it feels like this is never going to end. So that simple insertion of a word rather than this is never going to end, which feels Mm -hmm. so definite, right? But just, it feels like it's never going to end. And I know that it will at some point, life may look different. We may not ever go back to what life was like before, 
this will end in some ways, or we will move into a new normal in some ways. So I think inserting things like little word changes can matter a lot just for our own internal dialogue. Yeah. And, and that separating feeling from fact, what I mean by that is just, it feels like this is never going to end is a different statement than this is never going to end. You know, and, and we talk a lot about that. I, I was just talking about that with some of my students along the notion of imposter feelings, right? When you sort of feel like you're a fraud, whether that's as a student or in a new job or, you mm -hmm. know, some big level of responsibility you've been given that you just don't parent. feel ready for. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yes. 100% as a parent. Wait a minute. You didn't know what you were doing when you started this? I totally knew what I was doing. Not at all. No, that you're absolutely right. That's like the number one thing I probably feel like an imposter a lot of the time. Like, why are these mm. little humans looking at me? Like, I know what I'm supposed to do for them <laughs> with them. Yeah. But yeah. So so one of the best sort of clinical interventions when it comes to things like imposter feelings or just these really, you know, defining sense of hopelessness is that separating feeling from fact. So, you know, I know that I'm well-trained to do this and I feel terrified that I don't know what I'm doing, right? So similarly, you know, as a parent, like I have no idea what I'm doing mm -hmm. and I will figure it out with each mm -hmm. and, and do the best I can. And, and I am what these kids need, even mm -hmm. if I don't always feel like that. So that I think has really helped me kind of work through some of those big doom and gloom feelings of, oh my gosh, this is never going to get better. Okay. Well, it, it feels like that. Or, you know, I, I often like the way that um, Dr. Brene Brown frames the story I'm telling myself is Mm -hmm. This is never going to end. And so, okay, that's clouding the way I'm interacting with others because of that story I'm telling myself. Interesting. Oh, I like that. And I think we can, we can actually look at, like you said, the facts and the evidence is that things have changed. I mean, things look different now than they did in summer of 2020. And so there are perhaps those changes are more, you know, happening more slowly than we would like. Um, and they're not as cut and dry is when, you know, the pandemic started, it felt like, whoa, okay. One day the world was like this and now it's like this. And the actual quote unquote end of it is much more, you know, is much more slow moving and gradual. And I think sitting with that is, you know, important. And I think it's a reasonable feeling to think like, oh, this feels like it's never going to end because it has been going on for some time. But I would also say like, what would look different if there was a clear ending? I mean, what would be yeah. different for you? You know, how would you behave mm. differently? What, what would look different if there was a clear end? And, you know, chances are not that much. So mm -hmm. that's another way to think about it. That's right. It's reminding me too of, you know, in, in the developmental literature, we talk a lot about this idea of, you know, fixed mindsets versus growth mindsets. And when you're working mm. with kids to help them, especially in education spaces, a lot of the research supporting, you know, really emphasizing the growth mindset. So instead of, you know, a child saying something like I'm smart or I'm not smart, right? Mm -hmm. It's this idea of, I just haven't figured out how to solve this math problem yet. Mm -hmm. So it's not about a fixed trait, like you're smart or you're not, but it's just how do we help encourage that growth mindset of just, I haven't figured it out yet. I will, you know, mm -hmm. these are the things I need to help me figure it out. And I think about this, you know, quite similarly, trying to, again, separate feelings from facts, but also look at the growth aspects of this, which, you know, we've talked in previous episodes about the notion of what's called post-traumatic growth. Dr. Sharon Deagle talked about that in our episode with her and, and defined what post-traumatic growth is. We're talking about this kind of inner psychological change that the person experiences in the context of undergoing a very stressful event, possibly even traumatic, such as childbirth. How you are perceiving yourself these days is different from how you perceive yourself even in this case before childbirth. And this is about growth, meaning that you are enhancing yourself. You're even better psychologically than you were before pregnancy. And what we find um, about PTG, post-traumatic growth in general, that interesting enough, in many ways, it could coexist with stress. So for example, somebody could say, well, you know, I feel really depressed, but it's important for this person who's feeling postpartum depression to also maybe acknowledge that they are, you know, I just gave birth and actually my birth was really traumatic. And actually I'm like, if I think about it, I was strong to a degree that I actually couldn't even imagine I would be able to encounter such an event and kind of internalizing that and feeling good about yourself. Stress actually triggers growth. If there is no distress, 
trauma related, there's usually no growth. So remembering that even beyond just the normal stressors of this and uncertainties, as we have talked about, and, and the research has shown, people experience real trauma, you know, on, on a lot of different levels throughout this pandemic. But that doesn't have to be the end of the story. There are ways to really foster and cultivate post-traumatic growth, which I think is important, just like talking about growth mindsets with kids that can make all the difference in the world and how we look back and make meaning of this time. Mm -hmm. Right. Because what is the alternative, right? I, I mean, I know I'm, I'm teaching developmental psych right now and we talk about attachment, for example, and how important that first year of life is in terms of forming attachments to responsive, sensitive caregivers. But if you don't have those responsive, sensitive caregivers in your life, that's not like the end of the story. You're not doomed to, you know, it's like, well, sorry, you know, you didn't have that. So there's no way to make any changes or that's kind of set in stone. I mean, there are certainly ways of having relationships later in life where you can form secure attachments to others. And it's not like this doom and gloom piece of, well, no, nope, that was it. And so the alternative, I mean, whatever the traumatic experiences were, it's, it's awful and also inaccurate to think like, well, that's it then, you know, you can't do anything about that. Um, I mean, we certainly have lots of of well-tested and empirically based, you know, methods for coping with even the most terrible of traumas. And that's not to say that it's easy, but that there, there are resources out there. So what has that looked like for you? What has your growth been, would you say, for you as an individual um, over the last few years? <laughs> um, wow. Uh, let's see. I'm not very good at coping with uncertainty. And it's funny because one of the things that we looked at in our research was a construct called, you know, uh, tolerance of uncertainty. <laughs> and, you know, essentially there are individual differences in how much people tolerate uncertainty. And I was definitely like on the low tolerance end of uncertainty. Um, I think one of the big things that I've, that has come out of this is just having to learn to be like, well, okay, we don't, we don't know what this is going to look like. We don't know what life is going to look like in a month or a week maybe, um, or certainly a year. So we can't plan and we can't make these like definitive plans for what life is going to be like um, and what we are going to be like. Uh, I think I've become much better at that. It's still uncomfortable, but you know, the amount of experience that we've had with it now has has helped me with coping with uncertainty. Yeah. And you've had so many transitions over the last few years too, as I think about all the places you've <laughs> you know, moved and, and your kids starting different stages of, of schooling and stuff in, you know, your yeah. jobs and your spouse's job, you know, so it's like, in some ways, as you talked about before, like you didn't have a choice, you better just learn to deal with this uncertainty because there were so many variables you couldn't control. Right, exactly. And you kind of learn that a little bit as a parent, when you first become a new parent, you're like, oh, well, before, you know, I could, maybe you can't control everything in your life, like, um, but it certainly feels much more controllable than when you have this screaming infant in front of you mm -hmm. and you're like, and you really can control what they do and, and how that all goes and whether they sleep and all of that stuff. So you, you're faced with that challenge as a, as a new parent. And I think that this just, the pandemic really just brought that to the forefront. What about you? I, so I think it's so interesting that it was something that came out of your research that you've identified for yourself, this construct you studied. And then like, same for me, I think it's this construct I hadn't even thought much about before we started doing the research that we did, which is decision fatigue. So it was mm. just something I didn't have that much familiarity with. It had really only been studied a lot of times in like major healthcare decisions. So like mm -hmm. caregivers having to decide, make end of life decisions for a family member, you know, and so we hadn't really thought about it with parents much. And so we included that construct in our research. And I think it was out of necessity. Like I was realizing this is, I think this is the part I was struggling the most with throughout the pandemic was mm -hmm. just, I am having to make decisions constantly that feel so heavy and so weighty. And I had never realized even before the pandemic, just as a parent, how much of your day is spent making decisions and arrangements, right? Mm -hmm. For your family. And, and so you're deciding things about what to arrange and coordinate. And it's just constant. Who's picking them up? What are we having for dinner? What are we, you know, amidst a lot of decision-making many of us have to do in our jobs as well. Mm -hmm. So that 
was probably one of the hardest things that just got increasingly harder for me as time went on. And now it's like, you can't not know what you know. And so the reason that has become such a great growth area for me is, is recognizing my fatigue. Like I'm now much better at being able to say to people in my life, you know, whether that's at home to my husband, like, I don't care what we have for dinner. Like you just figure it out. I, I'm, I can't, I'm spent. I'm exhausted. I don't care if we drive through. I just do not want to be the one making the decision or arranging or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so similarly at work, like if there are just, I'm, I've sort of, I've had it that day, or I'm, I'm kind of at my level of fatigue with decision-making to be able to just say, okay, this actually doesn't really matter right now. I don't need to do that. Or just to delegate it. Like, do I really care that much about what this graphic looks like on this particular, mm-hmm. you know, brochure or something we're making? I really don't. <laughs> so, yeah. so letting go of that control and recognizing for myself, um, what decisions do I really need to make versus what can I let go or have somebody else do? That's mm-hmm. been an important part. I just didn't realize how much exhaustion that was causing me before the pandemic. So to have seen it come to light because of all the pressure to make decisions that that we just didn't have guidance for taught me a lot about my struggle with that. I think uh, the, our two constructs that we struggled with kind of go together as well, because I think one of the reasons it could be so fatiguing, is that a word? I think so to make decisions, um, at the be especially towards the beginning was because we didn't have a lot of clear information. So you felt like you were just, you know, making decisions in the dark kind of about what, I mean, so many decisions you feel like you can do research and you can figure out like, well, what is the best and something will emerge as a clear best answer. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to other things and with, you know, the pandemic, there just wasn't so it just became all the more exhausting I felt. So I think those decision fatigue and, and tolerance of uncertainty <laughs> probably go hand in hand in many ways. Yeah, I think so too. And I also think it helped us probably learn to advocate for ourselves better. Like that's what I love so much about positive psychology and the way that positive psychology approaches some of these questions is because it can be so reflective and help you learn this is what came out of this. This is how I grew. This is what I actually need to be able to keep coping or to demonstrate resilience in my life or help my family be resilient. So we've learned how to advocate for ourselves in different yeah. contexts too, that, you know, right. Is this something I need to be making a decision about or not? I've learned how to get out in front of that and mm-hmm. do small things in my life to reduce the amount of decisions I have to make mm-hmm. on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. And that's been really helpful. And, you know, for you to just figure out ways like, okay, I, I know this is going to be an uncertain situation, And I just have to be ready to deal with that. So you kind of go in intentionally into the uncertain situation. Right, right. What if I realized that I just need another sabbatical in my life? (laughs) (laughs) That's what I really realized. Yeah, well, good luck with that. Let me me know how that advocating for yourself works out for you. (laughs) No, but it's because there, it's funny though, because there are some things that happened that now, so my son was really upset about going to school this morning and it was quite stressful as a parent, um, you know, new school, it's only been a few days. He's like, well, I just want to stay home. And, you know, for a long time, that's what they did. And so now there's this, like having to explain, well, no, you, you can't just stay home and learn with us. You can't do that. Like you have to actually go into school, you know, but I'm sure he's thinking, but why? Like for two years or one year or whatever it was, like I basically was at home learning. So why can't I do that now? Well, and you had a clearly very different remote learning experience than my kids who were like, oh, thank God you're not our teacher. Anymore. <laughs> like they can't wait to get out the door and get back to real school. Or maybe um, there just wasn't that much learning happening. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Which is also right. Like, okay. I think that's a part of the the growth too is prioritizing, right? On some days, certain things were more important than others. On other days, we, you know, we took a lot of mental health days and that was also okay to model Mm -hmm. for them, I think. Okay. So let's end our discussion of positive psychology and applying it to the pandemic by practicing what we just preached, right? So you talked about how you would do in your gratitude journal, the three good, what did you call them? The three good things? The three good things. Yeah. The three, the three things, things. things. Mm-hmm. that went well that day or yeah. Or just the three good things, right? It could be, I had a really good cup of coffee um, <laughs> or something like that. Okay. Uh, so let's so- do our, our three good things for the pandemic throughout the last few years. Okay. 
few years. It's just mind blowing to me still. Um, Okay. I think mine would be saying no more often. Um, I've always struggled with that. And I think having young kids at home during the pandemic with the lack of time, I didn't really have a choice. Like I had to, to, to say no to more things. And I guess kind of, it was like a muscle, you know, practicing that like allowed me to kind of build it up and I've become a little bit better about it. Not still not great at it, to be honest, but you know, better than I was. Um, I'm not sure I would have gotten there without the push of that. So I think, and this might sound kind of cliche, but I think prioritizing relationships, you know, realizing how important those connections are, you know, losing my grandma during the pandemic and at least at the part where I could still go see her made me feel so, uh, just think so much about the people who didn't have that opportunity, you know, to see their loved ones or to be with their loved ones. Um, people who passed away, you know, especially towards the beginning of the pandemic. So just really trying to prioritize relationships and, and how at the end of the day, like, you know, we're not going to say, Oh, I really wish I had more time emailing people (laughs) on my deathbed, you know, I wish I had more, I don't know, whatever, but, um, Yeah. yeah. And then I think learning how much I love, you know, I would take these walks in the evenings and really learning how much I truly valued my alone time. And you don't get very much as a parent, but during the pandemic, you definitely yeah. didn't get very much. And that had a huge impact on me being able to take a walk at night by myself. Yeah. Oh, those are so good. I think for me, the first one is along the lines of some of what you talked about, just the gift of time, like time with people, time to slow down, time to stop and reset. You know, we, we lost our dog partway through, but we had this like extra year with him at, at home. I mean, Mm. that, you know, we were so grateful for, we're usually so busy. And, and so when we looked back after we had to put him down in um, spring of 2021, we were so grateful for this year we had gotten with him at home. So that, you know, just things like that. When I think about, the gift of time we had throughout the last few years in so many ways um, was huge time, you know, time with people and just time to be. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing would be uh, how, you know, Mr. Rogers always talks about like, look for the helpers in times of crisis. And I think just getting to see all these examples, big and small of people lifting each other up, watching communities step up for each other, be really, really creative about how to support their neighbors and support each other, um, whether that was virtually or, you know, just these creative drive-by celebrations. It was really amazing to watch the best of people come out in many ways throughout the pandemic to just lift each other up. So that always, um, yeah, it's just, it's Mm -hmm. awe-inspiring to me when I get to see how creative people can be to help each other. And I think the third would be just that this, like the privilege that you and I and our team have had to like walk with other parents for the last two and a half years is really just been incredible. I, I, you know, this was an accident Mm -hmm. that we started this and then just kind of see this need grow and and people really searching for community and for information um, and just support. So this has been such a privilege to be able to, to do this work. Um, so I think I'm really grateful for that too. Mm, I, yeah, I agree completely. And, and also on the creativity aspect and the ways of celebrating, I would like to amend mine to, to remove walks and, and put in the, um, the neighbor who, who shot Halloween candy through a leaf blower as, um, as a way to be able to give candy yeah. to kids who were trick-or-treating um, and maintain safe social distancing. So, mm-hmm. you know, those kinds of things um, were yeah. very heartwarming. All right. Well, okay. there we have it. Ending on a positive note, no pun intended. <laughs> this has been an episode of the Pandemic Parenting Podcast. We'd love to connect with you via email or on social media. Follow the links in our show notes or look for our blue and yellow logo when you search Pandemic Parenting on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, or TikTok. And this podcast isn't all we do. Pandemic Parenting is a 501c3 nonprofit providing free science-based resources for parents and all who care for children while navigating the COVID-19 pandemic. To learn more about our organization and access our extensive library of webinars, videos, blogs, and more, visit www.pandemic.com. Pandemic-parent.org.
This season of the podcast is produced by Victoria Bruick, Carmen Vincent, and myself, Dr. Amanda Zelahusky, with strategic support from Dr. Lindsay Malloy and Pandemic Parenting's Executive Director, Jennifer Valentine. Many thanks to the Pandemic Parenting team for their work in making this show happen, including Miranda Dauphiny, Lydia Lang, Julianne Matthews, Mark Snow, and Paula Sillers. If you want to support the work of Pandemic Parenting, you can do so in a few ways. You can leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple or Spotify. You can donate to our nonprofit at www.pandemic-parent.org slash support. And lastly, and most importantly, you can share this episode with parents and caregivers in your communities. Until next time, thanks for listening and please give yourself some grace today.